black stuff into and fissile materials. That's the way it's going to be. I'm sorry. We can do a bit of this. We can do a bit of that. We can bury the carbon underground. We can do some carbon trading. But actually, we're going to carry on building coal-fired power plants. That's the route to suicide. And we have to increasingly be robust in, in pointing that out to governments. That's what the climate debate is all about. So let me leave it at that and just say one other thing. This is my current career. This is my day job. My evening job is sort of reading the oil and gas journal and generally being a sad act and keeping up with this debate on uh, peak oil because I used to be a creature of the oil industry. I worked at Imperial College. I did research funded by BP and Shell on oil source rocks, the type of rock from which you get the organic material that gets cooked up underground into oil and gas. I did that for 11 years. Um, I was, I can't remember how rich I was as a consultant for those, those companies. I was once able to buy my daughter two horses. Um, those days are long gone. Um, but that's why I've kept up with this issue and why I have the nerve to, as a solar energy uh, salesman, if you like, uh, to tell you about, uh, what I think about peak oil. So let's go through this story now, and just to remind people of the debate, there are two end members. Let's call them the late toppers and the early toppers, the people who think that the peak of production will happen late in the piece in a few decades' time. Uh, Lord Brown at BP likes to say there's 40 years of supply at least, and the peak of production will be out in the, 90, in the 2030s. People who believe this, most oil companies and OPEC, and not all oil companies, there are some interesting wavering within the, uh, the companies. I don't know, people have seen the ads taken out around the world by Chevron, for example. Most, but not all, financial analysts and journalists, most governments and uh, the agencies that have been set up by the fossil fuel infrastructure, so the EIA and CIRA, the oil industry's favorite consultancy, Cambridge Energy Research Associates, the implications, um, economists can continue growing in principle, you know, provided things don't go completely pear-shaped in Iraq, provided Mr. Chavez behaves himself in Venezuela, provided Mr. Putin doesn't get too um, nationalistic in Russia, you know, all these things, it can, we can keep going, we can keep growing petroleum um, use at 1.8% per year, which has been the long-run average now. We're still growing it, despite everything we know about climate change. And there will be time to develop alternatives. And so this is why you get the softly, softly approach from the Shells and the BPs. If they were standing here tonight, they'd say, oh, Jeremy's, you know, exaggerating again, as he's done all these years. Uh, we are developing solar, we are developing wind, you know, and we've got, we're doing it slowly and steadily. My argument to them when I go and talk to them, because having once been one of them, I still get invited in because I don't froth at the mouth and sometimes wear a tie. And um, what I say to them it, on those occasions is what I'm saying to you now. These people have not shown the entrepreneurial zeal on the frontiers of the solar revolution that they've shown for 100 years on the frontiers of the hydrocarbon age. Um, that's putting it politely. They find it very, very difficult to break away from um, the addiction, the societal addiction, that keeps us and them locked into their core product. Anyway, that is uh, the preponderant view. That's what most finance ministries, if you go down the road and talk to your finance ministry or your economic ministry here, that's what you'll be told. Yeah, we can rely on this pretty much. Um, that's the model, after all. The alternative view is somewhat different, and it says that there's not as much oil and gas as we're being told out there. We need to worry about this, um, that the topping point in production, the day that we produce the most oil we ever can, will be sooner rather than later. Most of us think now 2010 plus or minus two years. So the believers in this are, a, this is important, a growing number of dissident experts, and these are mainly people who've been in the oil industry, or in some cases still are actually, um, or retired from it recently, 
Uh, some financial analysts and journalists get this. If you see in the press, uh, there's a growing number of articles of, of um, journal where journalists are saying, hey, I think we really do have a problem here. Uh, s some futures traders, I mean, it's been a long time now since the first $100 barrel traded on NYMEX, the futures ex exchange. And the implications are not good, you know, because we have become so oil addicted. You just think of agriculture and how oil dependent that is. That, you know, if we get to a point someday soon where we're expecting growing supplies of cheap, generally cheap oil, growing and cheap being the, cheap, the, the key words here, that's what we're expecting. That's what we're locking into, our corporate plans, our financial plans, our national economic plans are all depending on that. And then what actually happens is that, ooh, all of a sudden we hit the peak and we go over the top. And then we're no longer in cheap and growing land. We're in shrinking and expensive, fast shrinking and very expensive oil. And that is going to come as a shock that will hit our economic system in a way that it's very difficult to formulate um, a view of how that could be pleasant. So let's just look at a couple of views of just how um, bad the stakes might be here. Uh, this is a quote, um, you might want to think, who would say something like this? But uh, it's the US Department of Energy. They have an office of naval, petroleum, and oil shale reserves. The US military is the number one consumer of oil on the planet. And the uh, Navy is so worried that they won't be able to have enough oil for the fleet that they maintain a whole office working on this stuff. And the oil shales in Colorado and Wyoming with this kerogen that in principle, somebody one day might be able to work out how to bake that kerogen underground and turn it into oil. Of course, you'd need to burn a lot of fossil fuels or a lot of nuclear to do that. And that's what that whole office is trying to do. And this is what they say about the impact on the world economy. A serious demand side discontinuity could lead to worldwide economic chaos. Now, how about this one? Um, who do you think said this? They're not good at recognizing distant threats, even if their probability is 100%. Society ignoring this is like the citizens of Vesuvius. And it's another recent convert to the peak oil story, James Schlesinger, who was US Energy Secretary some years ago. He was also director of the CIA uh, when he was active in um, civil service. So um, a good way to think about this problem, if you're new to it, is to look at America itself, or at least America minus Alaska. Uh, Alaska complicates things a little bit. But in 1956, oil production in America in the lower 48 was going up very fast indeed. And these were times of plenty, not long after the war. Uh, America had essentially won the war, floating to victory on a sea of oil, as someone put it, while the Nazis had to try and go into Russia to get theirs, and the Japanese ran out all across the Pacific theater. Uh, and in 1956, in Shell's research lab, um, a gentleman working for Shell called Mr. Hubbard said, guys, we have a problem. Our production is going to peak, and I predict it's going to peak in 1971. Um, and he was laughed at vilified, treated in a thoroughly beastly way, particularly by the US government, the US Geological Survey. Uh, he was a great geologist, even in his time. I studied stuff that he did that had nothing to do with this as an undergraduate. Uh, and even in his lifetime, he was a great geologist. But anyway, that's what he predicted. And um, he was wrong. It peaked in 1970. He was out.